It's a pleasure to have with us Anirudh Majumdar. So Anirudh is a professor at Princeton University, where he heads the Intelligent Robot Motion Lab. With the knowledge of work, has received multiple awards, you know, multiple community awards, you know, like the Google Award, the Amazon Award, you know, award from Toyota, and the list goes on and on. He's also been a recipient of, you know, multiple best paper awards, you know, one from Ikra and recently from the paper of the year from IJRR. And so we are super excited to have Anirudh with us. And you know, many of us, you know, at least when we do machine learning, you know, we deploy our systems and cross our fingers and hope you know, that they work. And if they don't work, we are kind of clueless. And then we go through this whole process of experimentation and you know, almost bring psychology on our robots to figure out why they're not working, you know, before we can make the next jump and, you know, improve upon them. So I'm pretty excited because Anirudh is going to take the other view and say how, you know, we can, you know, have some guarantees on performance and, you know, maybe what are the limits on those guarantees. So I feel it's a very good time for these kind of exchanges between you know, what can we do in a principled manner? And what do we do if we cross our fingers? And, you know, how do we make them come together? So, Anil, we're super excited to have you. You know, please take it away. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Fulkit, for the uh, the nice introduction and, and for the invitation to, to present. Um, so, as Fulkit mentioned, uh, so I lead the Intelligent Robot Motion uh, Lab at, at Princeton, uh, and we work on enabling agile robotic systems, uh, things like unmanned aerial vehicles or, or legged robots and so on, uh, to operate with uh, formal guarantees on safety and performance in complex uh, environments. Uh, and over the last few years, uh, we've been thinking about how uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning in particular, uh, fits into this, this picture of, of trying to make uh, some formal guarantees on our uh, robotic uh, systems. So there's been an increasing adoption of, of machine learning uh, in the perception and control pipelines, of various robotic systems from robotic manipulators, uh, drones, and of course, also uh, autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, and I think a, a lot of the, the power of learning uh, comes from its ability to, to handle rich sensory inputs, uh, things like uh, visual uh, vision to raw, like visual inputs, uh, and process them into uh, representations that can then be used for uh, downstream tasks. Uh, and in the context of robotics, uh, you can potentially also uh, learn these uh, kind of neural networks uh, end to end. So going all the way from uh, RGBD images to, to actions. Uh, so the question I want to focus on is, is how can we provide some formal guarantees on, on safety and performance uh, for these kind of black box uh, learning enabled uh, robotic systems? Uh, and I think that the main technical challenge, as I see it in, in this uh, area, has to do with uh, generalization. So we're using some finite amount of training data to, to train our uh, perception and control systems. Um, how can we provide uh, some formal guarantees uh, beyond our finite uh, training data set? So when we deploy our systems in previously unseen environments, uh, what can we uh, say? Uh, so just to make things concrete, I'll, I'll use this as a kind of running example uh, throughout the, uh, the talk. Uh, so imagine that you have a drone uh, and you're training, let's say, a vision-based uh, navigation policy, vision-based obstacle avoidance policy, uh, using some finite uh, number of training environments. So these are environments from a particular data set, the Stanford 2D, 3D uh, data set. Uh, and imagine that you have a, a thousand of these, so some finite number of these uh, as your training data set. So someone has gone around and kind of uh, mapped out uh, various uh, indoor uh, environments in the setting. Uh, and you're training a, a policy, uh, maybe in the form of a neural network, uh, using these uh, finite number of training environments. Um, so use use some learning algorithm, maybe a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, that uh, trains your uh, neural network uh, to map images, RGBD images, uh, to actions, uh, to wide obstacles, and maybe get to, to some goal uh, location in these environments. Uh, so the question I, I want to focus on is, is what happens when you take this trained system uh, and then you deploy it on a new environment. So that's housing and first environment that was not part of your uh, training uh, data set. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to think about how we can uh, make some formal guarantees under some assumptions that I'll describe uh, that will uh, guarantee uh, with high probability that your robot will succeed uh, in a previously uh, unseen environment. 
Um, so I think this question of generalization, this problem of generalization is a real challenge that we see uh, in many robotic systems out there in the wild. Uh, this is one of Tesla's uh, uh, vehicles uh, that's driving down a, a highway kind of at uh, dusk, like to, uh, evening time. Uh, and the interesting thing here is what the, the perception system is outputting. So the perception system sees a yellow traffic light. Uh, but if you look at the uh, the video, of course, there's no yellow traffic light. It's actually just the, uh, the sun that's kind of low down in the sky. Uh, and it's perceiving that as a yellow traffic light. Uh, the car is actually trying to, to brake here. Um, in this case, the human driver is, is paying attention. Uh, and if you look at the bottom of the video, you'll see that the, the driver is kind of pre pressing the gas pedal uh, to override the, the command. Uh, so this perception system was trained using uh, gigantic amounts of data, lots and lots of different environments, different settings, uh, but it's not uh, able to generalize uh, to this uh, different environment. Um, here's another one of uh, uh, Tesla's uh, vehicles. Um, so let me just play the video. Next up is an office chair. I programmed and labeled quite a few of these in the past while working at Tesla. Let's see how well it detects the object. All right, let's try that again. But this time, we'll spin the chair so it no longer is considered a static object. No, nothing on the chair there. Here you'll see Tesla show a pedestrian on screen instead of a chair, yet it still fails to stop. Yeah, so I think this is another example of a of a failure to to generalize. Um, yeah, what's happening? What's kind of interesting here is that uh, it sees that there is an object. It interprets as a as a human, uh, maybe because of the the training data set that it was exposed to. Uh, maybe doesn't have so many chairs in in kind of the middle of the road, uh, but it's not uh, able to correctly perceive uh, what this object is. Uh, and it also happens to, to take the wrong uh, actions in this case, uh, which is like it doesn't break, which is kind of uh, interesting. And I, I think we see this uh, challenge of generalization, not just in uh, autonomous vehicles, but many other uh, domains as well. If we're thinking about uh, robotic manipulation, uh, we use some uh, number of training environments to, to train our robotic systems, but uh, making sure that they generalize to, to different environments is a, is a major uh, challenge, I think. Um, so I would argue that the current uh, kind of state-of-the-art uh, learning-based systems often fail to, to generalize to even mildly different uh, environments. And I see this as a, as a fundamental technical challenge if we want to uh, deploy particularly safety-critical robotic systems uh, out in the wild. Uh, so there's been a, a lot of uh, work, as, as Pulkit mentioned, on uh, kind of empirically uh, focused like efforts uh, to try to, uh, to improve uh, generalization. A lot of this comes from the, the reinforcement learning uh, work. Uh, so techniques such as uh, domain randomization, data augmentation, uh, online adaptation, regularization, and so on. Uh, so many different kind of empirical efforts to, to improve uh, generalization. Uh, what I'll focus on is, is slightly different, maybe a, a bit complementary, uh, which is how can we provide uh, some meaningful formal guarantees on generalization for our learning-enabled uh, robotic systems. Uh, in the talk today, I want to focus on some particular uh, challenges. Uh, so robotic systems that have uh, potentially non-linear or even hybrid uh, dynamics, uh, rich sensory inputs, uh, I'll focus particularly on, on vision or, or depth, uh, and finally neural network-based control policies, uh, neural networks as part of the, uh, the perception or, or control uh, architecture. Uh, and my goal today is kind of to, to basically try to convince you uh, that it's at least possible uh, to make some pretty non-trivial uh, formal guarantees, uh, even under uh, such settings. Uh, before I do that, let me kind of just try to justify this uh, research, uh, this line of research. So why uh, study uh, formal guarantees or why pursue formal guarantees? I think there are a number of uh, reasons that I see as pretty important. Uh, one practical reason is if we want to deploy our robotic systems out there in the wild, uh, particularly in safety critical systems, uh, safety critical settings, uh, I think it's it's uh, would be pretty nice to to have some formal safety assurances. Of course, in addition to uh, to also doing thorough uh, empirical uh, evaluations, uh, I think formal assurances give us more confidence when we're uh, when we're deploying these systems out in the wild. Uh, another, I think, reason is is that uh, thinking about formal guarantees and formal models uh, helps us uh, state our assumptions in a in a kind of really concrete way. Uh, and I see a lot of power uh, in, in uh, good formal models. Uh, so formal models of, of learning, uh, pack learning, probably approximately correct learning, or formal models of 
communication or, or computation, like information theory and, and Turing machines. Uh, from my perspective, uh, like these things have been a, a long-term uh, enabler of pro a progress, uh, and this comes from uh, concretely writing down exactly what we mean by generalization uh, in, in, in robotics, for instance. Uh, another application is, is checking when our assumptions break. Uh, so if we've stated our assumptions, we have some formal guarantees. Uh, if we see that those guarantees are, are not being uh, valid in, in the real world, uh, then that gives us a way uh, to, to check whether our assumptions were in fact correct. Uh, and we can actually turn that into some algorithms, uh, as I'll describe uh, in this uh, talk uh, today. Okay, so I'll uh, talk about three kind of directions uh, that, that we've been pursuing, uh, motivated by uh, this research of, of trying to make formal guarantees on, on learning-enabled systems. Uh, so the first uh, direction is going to be uh, describing learning uh, control policies uh, with guarantees on, on generalization. Uh, the second direction will be uh, performing out of distribution detection. So what happens if your uh, robot is deployed in environments that are pretty different uh, from the environments that was trained on? Uh, how can we detect that? And potentially, how can we also generalize? Uh, and the last direction, which I won't focus too much on, I'll, I'll spend most of the talk uh, today talking about the first two directions. Uh, the third direction is a, a kind of recent line of work where we're thinking about fundamental limits on perception-based control. Uh, so if you have noisy sensing, uh, imperfect sensing, uh, other uh, just fundamental limits on what your robot can achieve with those noisy sensors, uh, no matter what learning algorithm you use or what uh, kind of uh, uh, control theoretic uh, technique uh, you use. Okay, so let's let's start with uh, the first one. So learning uh, policies with guarantees on generalization. Uh, so there's been a, a quite a bit of work uh, in the the topic of uh, uh, safety and, and learning. Uh, most of this work, I think, has been under the umbrella of safe learning, uh, which is the, the problem of trying to ensure that your robot doesn't violate any safety constraints uh, during the learning process. Uh, so in the stunning example of a, of a drone, uh, maybe the drone is learning to perform a new maneuver. Uh, and the safe learning uh, formulation uh, would try to ensure that as the robot is learning, as it's updating its policy, uh, it doesn't violate any safety constraints. So it doesn't crash into the, the ground uh, or the obstacle, for instance. Uh, and there have been a, a number of different approaches uh, trying to tackle this problem of safe learning. Uh, so Hamilton, Jacobi, reachability theory, robust MPC, uh, Gaussian process regression, uh, and also uh, formal methods-based uh, techniques. Uh, the main point I want to emphasize is that most of the, uh, the literature on, on safe learning uh, considers safety during the training process. So as the robot is updating its policy, how do you ensure uh, safety? Uh, and typically with these formulations, the environment that the robot is doing the learning in uh, is assumed to be uh, to be fixed. Uh, what I'm going to focus on instead is, is somewhat complementary, uh, not necessarily safety during the training process, uh, but rather safety uh, during deployment. So what happens if you take your learned policy, you fix it, and then you deploy it uh, on previously unseen environments? So I guess this is what I mean by uh, the problem of uh, generalization. Uh, so here's a, a more kind of formal uh, problem statement, uh, a concrete model of exactly what we mean by generalization, at least one possible model. Uh, so your robot has some dynamics. X here is the state of the robot. U is the control input. Uh, and E is the environment uh, that the robot is uh, operating in. Uh, and I'm going to use the word environment pretty broadly here to refer to factors that are external uh, to the robot. Uh, if you're thinking about obstacle avoidance or navigation, think about the uh, the building, maybe the, the indoor kind of obstacles um, as corresponding to the environment. Uh, if you're thinking about robotic manipulation, think about the object that the robot wants to manipulate uh, as corresponding uh, to the environment. Uh, the main assumption that I'm going to make, at least for the first kind of part of the talk, talk uh, is that your environments are going to be drawn from some unknown uh, distribution over environment. So there's some maybe super complicated distribution over uh, buildings uh, that your robot might encounter or objects uh, that your robot might encounter. Uh, we don't know what the distribution is. We just assume uh, that it uh, exists. Uh, moreover, we assume, uh, again, for the, the first part of the talk, uh, that we have some finite training data set of environments uh, that are drawn uh, IID uh, from this underlying but unknown uh, training uh, distribution. And we have capital N uh, such training environments. Uh, the robot has some sensor. Again, the, the goal here is specifically to, to think about uh, rich sensing inputs uh, like RGBD. 
Uh, and the, uh, the goal is to, to learn some control policy. So given this training data set of environments, uh, learn a policy that maps um, images, uh, so sensor observations to control inputs, or more generally, uh, histories of, of uh, sensor observations uh, to uh, control inputs. Uh, and just to kind of make things uh, relatively uh, concrete, I'll focus here on end-to-end -end, uh, training. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll say how we can kind of go maybe uh, beyond end-to-end uh, -end training, but but for now, just imagine that you're uh, using a reinforcement learning algorithm um, to, to train your policy given the, the training environments. Uh, we have some cost function that encodes our, our, uh, our uh, task. Um, so the cost of deploying uh, some policy on environment E, that's uh, the C pi E, uh, we're going to assume is, is bounded, um, but we won't make any further assumptions. So we want to assume Lipschitzness or, or continuity or so on. Um, so one uh, possible kind of cost function assigns a cost of one. If you collide with an obstacle, uh, let's say a cost of zero if you don't collide uh, and successfully reach uh, a target. Uh, and the, the final assumption is that uh, for any uh, policy uh, uh, that we want, we can basically evaluate the, the cost of the policy on our training environment. So we can run any policy we, we want on the, the finite number of training environments uh, we're assuming access to. Okay, so with that set up, the, the goal is to, to learn uh, a control policy given this finite training data set uh, that minimizes the expected cost across future environments uh, that are drawn from this uh, unknown underlying uh, distribution over environments. So we're, uh, that, that's the kind of objective we're interested in. Uh, and the main challenge just to, to emphasize this is that we don't know what this distribution is. We just have indirect access to it uh, in the form of a, of a finite number of training uh, environments. Okay, so uh, I guess before describing the, the approach uh, we'll take to, to tackle this problem, uh, so I mentioned that the word kind of formal guarantees a, a number of times, uh, so I want to be a bit more specific about uh, exactly what I mean by, by formal guarantee and uh, the kind of interpretation uh, of guarantees uh, that we're going to uh, pursue in this talk. Uh, so when I say formal guarantees in this talk, what I'm referring to are frequentist uh, style guarantees. Uh, so if I run my uh, robot uh, in a million different environments, uh, I'm going to see 1% uh, uh, collisions, like for instance, or less than 1% collisions. Uh, and that's something that's checkable. So I can run my robot in a million different environments and I can see whether uh, the guarantee I made actually translates uh, in that kind of frequentist uh, sense. So do I actually see less than 1% uh, collisions? Uh, this is in contrast to the, the kinds of uh, probabilities or, or guarantees you might make with a, a Bayesian style approach, uh, for example, based on uh, Gaussian process uh, regression. Um, what I would argue is that when we're thinking about making guarantees in safety critical uh, robotic systems, uh, typically what we uh, want are, are frequent style uh, guarantees. If I run an autonomous vehicle in many different environments, or if I run a drone, uh, in many different environments, or if I have a robotic manipulator that's uh, trying to uh, manipulate uh, many different uh, uh, objects, uh, what is the, the probability of success? And that's something we can like actually test, right? Like we can run our robot and see whether uh, the guarantees we make actually uh, are, are valid. Uh, and I think that the main challenge- so maybe, uh, maybe a, a quick question over there. Yes. Maybe I'm going to answer it, right? But, so I mean, I would interpret the Bayesian probability as also something that I can test by doing a particular evaluation, right? I guess yes. the only thing whether it is calibrated or not. I think that's the yes, question. good. Okay, that's that's exactly what I mean. Uh, and so I think that the calibration question is is exactly the, the right question. Uh, so often with with uh, Bayesian uh, uh, kind of probabilities, they're not uh, well calibrated, uh, and and they're tied to the uh, prior basically that that you use uh, for the the Bayesian uh, reasoning. So just as a as a simple example to to make this more concrete, imagine that you have a a biased coin, you don't know uh, what the bias is. Uh, so let's say that the true bias is like 0.7. So the true uh, unknown probability of heads is, is 0.7. Uh, and let's say we have some, some prior on, on heads. Maybe this is a beta distribution that's uh, kind of concentrated at, at 0.1. Uh, imagine that you collect some small uh, data set of tosses, maybe five uh, coin tosses, uh, and then you uh, update your uh, posterior belief on the probability of heads. If you have a small uh, number of, uh, of tosses uh, and, uh, and your prior was, uh, let's say, like 0.1, and then the posterior is going to be something that's uh, much smaller than, than 0.7. Uh, 
Um, so if you think about heads as maybe some kind of um, bad events, like a collision, uh, then we're severely underestimating uh, the probability of, uh, of collisions uh, using this Bayesian style reasoning. Um, so this is in contrast to a, a frequentist approach uh, where you would get a, a bound uh, on the true probability of heads. Uh, the bound could be loose, uh, but with high probability, uh, it's going to contain uh, the true uh, kind of uh, a bias of the, the coin. Uh, question? Um, yeah, sorry if I'm asking something sort of silly, but it seems like uh, regardless of which, whether it's Bayesian or frequentist, that you have to assume some sort of prior distribution over environments to quantify this. Like, you know, maybe I assume environments are distributed one way. I say, oh, this is an extremely rare situation I'd run into, but that's actually not the case. And that's super frequent. Yeah, good. So I'll talk about how to incorporate uh, priors in a, in a bit. Um, so the setup, I, I guess we're going to work with uh, is frequentist in the sense that uh, we want to assume some kind of parametric description of the uh, environments that you're, of the distribution over environments. Uh, we're it. just going to say that there's some distribution uh, and we have kind of indirect access to it in the form of uh, samples uh, from that distribution. Uh, and we're going to try to make some uh, bound, some guarantee on the uh, expected cost on on future examples. Uh, so that's that's what I mean specifically by uh, by uh, by frequentists. Uh, but you're perfectly right. Actually, that was the, the next point I was, was going to make is uh, Bayesian reasoning, of course, provides a, a really uh, neat and powerful way uh, to incorporate uh, some prior knowledge, some inductive bias, um, and and that can help learning uh, quite a bit. Um, so I think one important question is: Can we still provide uh, guarantees that have a frequentist style interpretation that are calibrated? Uh, in a uh, uh, in a frequent sense, uh, while still incorporating some uh, prior knowledge that we might have on our uh, problem, uh, and ideally better inductive bias, so inductive bias that actually uh, more accurately captures uh, the distribution that your uh, robot is going to encounter, uh, should ideally lead to, to stronger uh, frequent style guarantees, so more confident uh, bounds, uh, for instance. Uh, so this is the the kind of uh, picture maybe that that uh, that I have in my head. Uh, so you have a, a number of inductive biases, so maybe demonstrations from humans, uh, world models that are approximate, uh, some uh, intuitions about what your control policy should be, uh, compositionality, and so on. Uh, and we uh, take these inductive biases, uh, churn them through a, a learning algorithm that produces two things. So one is a, is a policy, uh, so control policy, uh, and the other is a generalization uh, guarantee uh, on uh, future environments that are drawn from the underlying uh, distribution of environments. Okay, so uh, here's the, the approach that, that we're going to pursue. Um, the main technical tool we've been exploring over the, the last couple of years uh, is what's known as generalization theory. So this comes from uh, theoretical machine learning. Uh, it's primarily been developed in the context of uh, supervised learning, so things like image recognition tasks. Uh, what we've been doing is taking some of that theory and extending it uh, to the, uh, uh, the reinforcement learning or, or policy learning setting uh, that I described a, a few slides ago. Uh, the specific technique we've been exploring is, is called pack based theory. So PAC stands for probably approximately correct. That's kind of the, the frequentist part. Uh, and this, this approach allows us to bake in uh, inductive biases in, in a way that I'll describe uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, but basically, the, the main kind of result of this theory is that it gives us an upper bound on the quantity that we're interested in, so an upper bound on the expected cost uh, on future environments that are drawn from this uh, unknown distribution over environments. Uh, the algorithmic approach then is to uh, minimize this upper bound. So we want to try to find some control policy uh, that gives us the, the best possible uh, guarantee we can get with this theory. Uh, and that optimization we can do uh, via like multiple methods like convex optimization or more uh, generic techniques uh, like stochastic gradient descent uh, or derivative free uh, optimization. Uh, so I'll give a, a very quick kind of intro to, to the main result from, from pack based theory. Uh, in the supervised learning setting, and then I'll describe how to uh, extend that uh, to the policy learning setting that uh, that we care about. So in the supervised learning setting, again, we'll assume that there's some unknown uh, distribution D over inputs, so some distribution over images uh, that, that your system might encounter. Uh, again, we'll assume that there's a training uh, data set uh, of examples that are drawn uh, IID from this distribution. Uh, and PackBase applies to learning algorithms that have this following kind of pretty general structure. 
so instead of working with single like deterministic hypotheses, uh, we're going to work with uh, distributions over hypotheses. So just to make this concrete, imagine that you have picked a, a particular uh, neural network architecture, uh, maybe a convolutional neural network. Uh, and we're going to parameterize uh, distributions over the weights of the network. So maybe think of uh, Gaussian distributions over the, the weights of your uh, neural net parameters. Uh, we're going to pick some prior distribution over the, the weights of the network. So that's kind of the, the main mechanism for incorporating inductive bias, uh, prior knowledge. Uh, and then based on the training data set that we see, uh, and potentially also based on the, the prior uh, we're going to choose some posterior distribution, uh, capital P, uh, again, over the, the weights of the, uh, the network. Uh, and I'll just kind of clarify here that the posterior doesn't have to be the Bayesian posterior. So the result I'll present uh, actually holds for any choice of a posterior distribution uh, that depends on the training data set and, and the, the prior. Uh, here's the, the main result from, from pack based theory. Again, the, the supervised learning context. Uh, so it says that with probability one minus delta, so delta is a parameter that you get to choose over the sampling of your training data set, uh, we can upper bound the quantity that we care about. So we can upper bound the true expected loss uh, on future data that are drawn from this uh, underlying distribution over examples uh, as a combination of two terms. Uh, the first term is the training loss. So we can evaluate that uh, given our training data set. Uh, the second term you can think of as kind of a, a regularization term or a complexity term uh, that essentially captures how far away the posterior moves from the prior. Uh, the main term in this regularization uh, is a KL divergence between the posterior and the prior. Um, so you can think of this as kind of a balance between training your uh, or fitting your or tra your training data well, so minimizing training loss uh, and not moving too far away uh, from your uh, prior distribution. Um, so this provides a, a guarantee on generalization, uh, so bound on the expected loss on future data, uh, and the bound can be computed using quantities that we have access to, so the training data set, uh, and the regularization uh, term is something we can uh, compute uh, as well. Okay, so that, that was supervised learning. That's the, the main kind of result from PackBase. Uh, so the question we've been thinking about is how can we extend uh, PackBase uh, to the policy learning setting uh, that I described? Uh, I think the main technical challenge here is the kind of non-IID-ness uh, uh, from time step to time step. So as your robot operates in a particular environment, uh, the observations, the sensor observations that it receives are, of course, not uh, independent uh, from, from time step to time step. Uh, but the main kind of trick here is that we assume that the environments that your robot uh, operates in, so buildings or, or objects, uh, those are drawn IID uh, from this unknown uh, kind of distribution over uh, environments. Um, so with that, we can uh, map our policy learning setting that I described uh, onto the, the supervised learning setting. So again, in the supervised learning setting, we have an input maybe corresponding to an image. We have a hypothesis that takes the, the image, maps it to a label. We have a loss that tells us how well any hypothesis does on, on any given image. Uh, and PackBase gives us this uh, bound on the expected loss on new input data. Uh, we're going to map our policy learning setting onto the supervised learning setting by thinking about the environment that the robot operates in as corresponding to the, the input, the control policy as corresponding to the hypothesis. So the policy uh, indirectly maps uh, the environment to actions, uh, sequences of actions indirectly via sensor measurements. We have a cost function uh, that tells us how well any given policy does uh, on any given environment. Uh, and with this kind of uh, mapping, which I've described informally, but you can make this more formal, uh, we can extend the, the result uh, of PackBase from supervised learning to the, uh, the policy learning setting. Uh, so here's the, the result. So it looks very similar to the supervised learning setting. Uh, again, it says that with probability one minus delta or the sampling of your training data set, uh, we can upper bound the quantity that we care about. So the true expected cost on future environments as a combination of the training cost uh, and the same kind of uh, regularization term that we saw in uh, supervised learning. Uh, so this again provides a, a guarantee on generalization, uh, so bound on the, the the future expected cost uh, on uh, on environments, unseen environments. Okay, so I guess what can we do with this bound? Uh, so one thing we can do is is operationalize this bound by by minimizing it. Uh, so we can fix some prior distribution. We can collect our training data set. Uh, and then we can find a, a posterior distribution or the weights of our uh, neural network uh, control policy 
Uh, maybe let's say you have Gaussian distributions on the, the weights of the network. Uh, so we can find some, some posterior distribution that uh, minimizes this, uh, this upper bound uh, using kind of a variety of different techniques. So if you uh, want to use uh, reinforcement learning techniques, for instance, uh, you can adapt those um, to, instead of minimizing the kind of standard objective, you minimize the training loss plus this extra uh, regularization term uh, that's specified by, by PacBase. Uh, so at the end of this process, we end up with two things. Uh, one is a distribution over policies, so distribution over the weights of your uh, neural network policy, uh, and then a certificate of performance, so an upper bound uh, on the expected cost on, uh, on future uh, environments. All right, so I guess that's a sketch of the approach. Maybe before uh, describing the, uh, the results, are there any uh, questions on, on this? All right, so let's see uh, the, the kinds of results we're, we're able to get with this theory. Uh, so one of the, the examples uh, that we uh, implemented this is a drone navigation example. Uh, we're using the, the Parrot Swing drone, which is kind of a, a fun platform. It's a hybrid uh, between a, a fixed swing and a, and a quad rotor, so it takes off vertically, but then transitions to, to forward uh, flight. Uh, the sensing here is in the, the form of a, a depth image. Uh, we actually were cheating a little bit here, so we don't have a, a depth camera on the drone. We're simulating uh, depth images from the perspective of the drone using off-board sensing. Uh, so the off-board sensor is a mocap mo mo system, uh, sees where the drone is, uh, sees where the obstacles are, uh, and it simulates what a depth image uh, would look like from the perspective of the, the drone. Uh, and that's the only information, that depth image is the only information uh, that the drone is using for, for navigation. Uh, we have a neural network policy that takes in as input the stepped image uh, and outputs a, a choice of a, a set of uh, kind of pre-computed motion primitives. So these are things like flight straight, turn left, bank right, and so on. Uh, so the neural, neural net takes a depth image uh, and chooses some motion primitive uh, to, uh, to execute. Uh, this was trained purely in, in simulation using some number of training environments, and then we deploy it on our uh, hardware system. Uh, so the environments here are these kind of... Uh, uh, consists of these cylindrical uh, obstacles that are randomly placed at different locations. Uh, the guarantee that we get uh, in this case with Backbase with a thousand training environments is 93%. Uh, this is the bound on the success rate. Uh, so the uh, success here just means uh, not colliding with the obstacles and getting to the, the end of the, the course. Uh, and we tested this empirically on, on many different environments on hardware. Uh, and we see that the, the bound we get from the theory actually translates uh, onto the real hardware system, so 28 out of uh, 30 uh, successes empirically. Uh, so let me just play the video just to give you a So I mean, while these videos are playing, so what was the training distribution versus the test distribution over here? Yeah, so the distribution here is the, the same. So I'll, I'll come to the, the kind of auto distribution setting uh, in just a minute. But here, uh, the thing that's different are the specific environments. Uh, so the environments have not been seen during training, uh, but the, the underlying distribution is, is, uh, is still the same. Yep. So this is most, so this is showing the calibration, then I think, more than anything else, right? That the yes. success is calibrated with what the exactly exactly right 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 yeah and I think this this calibration uh, like traditionally has been like pretty challenging for for neural network uh, policies uh, that are like processing uh, kind of raw sensory inputs uh, so I think yeah that that's the the main uh, message here that we're able to get uh, calibrated uh, like frequent style uh, guarantees uh, even when we're uh, working with uh, neural networks in, in these settings. So does this also imply that the Gaussian prior is a good one for neural networks to get calibrated, uh, you know, performance? Or do you think there's a particular choice of the environment where Gaussian works well, but in general, that is not a good prior to have? Yeah, so I guess specifically the, the Gaussian here is on the weights of the neural network. Uh, so it's not uh, Gaussian distributions on the, on the environment somehow. Uh, um, one, I guess, nice feature of Pagway is, is that you're always guaranteed to get uh, a bound, so like a calibrated uh, bound. Uh, so the bound could be bad, uh, but it's always uh, like valid in, in a frequent sense. Um, and yeah, I think Gaussians uh, kind of 
carefully chosen uh, as priors uh, like tend to work work pretty well. Um, like you can capture uh, like multimodal distributions from input to output, uh, even if the the weights are uh, are Gaussian. Um, and yeah, I guess we've explored a, a few different ways of, of specifying the the prior. Um, so one example is, is to use imitation data. So if you have uh, expert demonstrations, uh, you can fit a, a kind of Gaussian uh, distribution on the the weights of your network uh, that that captures the the imitation data. Uh, or if you have a kind of base policy uh, that's generated using a model based technique, you can use that plus a residual. Uh, and then you have like Gaussian weights on the, uh, the residual. So yeah, I guess we've explored a, a few different uh, approaches for uh, specifying the, the prior distribution. And, and does it require, like, I mean, there's the mean and then there's the variance of your, the Gaussian, right? So does it require yes. giving the standard deviation with the prior or you can just set it to like something Yeah, so we... Right, so we do have to specify some uh, kind of uh, standard deviation. Uh, often, like choosing that to be pretty wide uh, okay. tends to, to work well, uh, like empirically. Um, there are like other tricks where you can uh, pick the the scale of the the standard deviation in a in a particular way. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think often we find find that picking something okay. wide uh, like works reasonably well empirically. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we've also implemented this on, on other examples. So I'll go through, through this kind of quickly. So one is a, a grasping example. This was using a, a real uh, RGBD camera, so not simulated. Uh, and we collected demonstrations uh, using a 3D mouse uh, for uh, grasping. Uh, and, and that imitation data was used to train our prior. Uh, we then trained a posterior using the, the, the pack based bound uh, and then deployed the, the resulting policies on, on hardware. Uh, again, here we see that the success rate is uh, the guaranteed success rate from pack waves uh, is about 93%. Uh, the prior, which is just based on imitation data, uh, gets a success rate of around 83%. Uh, the posterior, once you do the training with, with pack waves, gets you a 98% uh, success rate in SIM. Uh, and depending on the random seed uh, on hardware, uh, the success rate ranges from 96 to, uh, to 100% uh, on, on these objects. Um, yeah, we have other examples. Uh, so this was a collaboration with uh, Jaime Fisak where uh, we were implementing uh, this uh, combined with a safe learning approach that I won't go into uh, for vision-based uh, quadruped navigation. So this is uh, just based on uh, RGB images. Actually, we weren't using the, the depth channel here uh, and it's, it's uh, navigating through these different indoor environments uh, and getting to uh, some goal uh, location that's marked by the, the kind of tape at the, at the end. Um, and the training environments here were, were pretty diverse uh, kind of indoor environments. Uh, and the, the pack base bound here is, is a bit uh, lower. So it's 70% uh, success rate. Uh, this is a more uh, challenging example. And the empirical success rate is around 78% uh, uh, or so. Okay, so I guess this, maybe we can get to, to Polkit's question. Uh, so what happens uh, when there is a, a distribution shift? Uh, so, so far we're assuming that uh, the, this, the environments are drawn from the same underlying distribution. Uh, and I think there are two questions here that are interesting to think about in this kind of outer distribution setting. Uh, one question is, can we even detect uh, that the robot is operating outer distribution? So can we perform uh, OOD uh, detection? Uh, in principle, this could allow the robot to act more conservatively if it's detecting that it's operating uh, outer distribution or maybe sees its operations uh, altogether uh, and collect more data to, to retrain. Uh, the other question is, can we learn policies that are somehow robust uh, to, uh, to distribution shifts? Uh, so let me start with the, the first question. So can we perform uh, auto-distribution detection? Uh, again, I'll use the drone as a running example. So you've trained your drone using a certain number of training environments from some distribution, and then you deploy it on environments, maybe where there's a wind gust, so a change in the dynamics, uh, or maybe where you have more uh, cluttered uh, environments. Uh, I think when we're thinking about OOD detection in robotics context, there are two uh, criteria that, that we would uh, like to have. Uh, one is that uh, we want some kind of guaranteed confidence uh, bounds on the outer distribution detector. Uh, so bounds on the false positive and, and false negative rates uh, of outer distribution uh, detection. The other criterion, which is maybe a bit more subtle, uh, is that we want our detection to be uh, task relevant. Uh, so there's some portion of the environment that's changing uh, from training to test, uh, but that doesn't have any impact on our 
uh, actual performance. Uh, in some sense, we don't care that there has been a di distribution shift uh, because that distribution shift is not impacting our, our performance. So that's what I mean by a kind of task relevant uh, distribution shift uh, detection. So the approach at a high level that, that we've been pursuing is, is building upon the, the back base work. Uh, so we use the approach that I described to, uh, to train a policy uh, with a, a associated bound on the, the performance on the training distribution. Uh, you then deploy your policy on new environments, potentially from a different distribution. Uh, and you see if your bound is being violated. So the bound on the performance, if you run your policy uh, and you see that you're getting higher cost than you would have predicted, uh, then that implies that your robot is operating out of distribution uh, because the, the bound is being violated. And you can kind of turn that into uh, guaranteed uh, confidence uh, rates. So uh, bounds on the uh, false positive and false negative rates of, uh, of detection. Um, so we implemented this on, again, this is the drone example uh, that I was uh, sketching before. Uh, here, the distribution shift is in, in the form of uh, dynamics. So we have a a fan at the bottom left of the picture uh, that's uh, that's uh, generating a wind gust uh, from zero to five uh, meters per second. Uh, and what happens is as you increase the, the wind, uh, the drone gets kind of closer and closer to the obstacles, uh, as you'll see in the, the next couple of flips. Uh, so that's our cost. So our cost here uh, corresponds to the, the distance from the obstacles. So in the training distribution, we have some bound on the expected cost uh, that comes from our pack base theory. Uh, we're seeing that bound being violated. We're coming closer to the obstacles than we would have predicted on our training distribution. And that's kind of the, the signal we're using uh, for performing auto distribution uh, detection. Uh, so this is a, a plot that's showing the, the confidence. So as we increase the, the amount of wind uh, going from zero to five meters per second, the robot gets more and more confident uh, that it's operating uh, out of uh, out of distribution. Okay, so that was the, the first part, uh, so OOD detection. But of course, in practice, we want to also not just detect uh, when the robot is operating out of distri distribution, but actually be uh, robust uh, to different uh, distribution shifts. Um, so here's a, a kind of simple example. So we have uh, mugs uh, with particular geometries and colors uh, that you use to train your robot. Uh, maybe at that time, uh, you're seeing uh, mugs from a, a different uh, distribution. Um, one possibility is to have kind of a distributionally robust uh, approach. So maybe you define some KL divergence um, ball uh, of, of distributions around your training distribution, uh, and you train a policy that's robust to uh, any distribution around some KL ball around the, the training distribution. Uh, there are ways to do this, so we can kind of uh, modify the, the pack base uh, objective that I presented before uh, using risk metrics, the entropic risk in particular, uh, that gives you these kinds of guarantees to uh, distribution shifts within some KL ball around the distribution. Uh, but I think this kind of approach is not super uh, satisfying uh, because a KL ball uh, doesn't really have a kind of physical uh, meaning necessarily. Uh, and as an example, imagine that you've trained your uh, manipulation policy uh, using objects that have a particular color, let's say red, and then at test time you see uh, objects with a, a different color, let's say blue. Um, in some sense, there has been a, a distribution shift because the color is changing, uh, but this should not really impact the, the performance of your policy uh, because the, the change is in some task irrelevant uh, feature uh, color in this case. Uh, that doesn't really uh, impact your, your performance. So if you look at the KL divergence between training and test distributions, this is gigantic. Like if color is a feature, uh, then potentially you even have infinite uh, KL divergence if the supports of the distributions uh, don't overlap. Uh, but in some sense, because color is, is not relevant, uh, there's no distribution shift. Uh, so we've been thinking about how to even specify uh, distribution shifts that capture um, only like task relevant uh, features of, uh, of environments. Uh, I won't go into the, the approach here, but uh, we have a, a approach based on kind of distribution robust uh, optimization, DRO, uh, using the, the Wasserstein metric. Uh, the main idea here is to, to learn some latent representation of your environments uh, that captures only task relevant uh, variations uh, in those environments. So uh, somehow like figuring out that color is not relevant or some other features are not relevant and maybe shape is relevant uh, to your uh, task. Uh, fixing that 
uh, latent representation and then doing uh, distribution robust uh, optimization where the distributions are over that uh, kind of latent representation. Uh, and you can do this via uh, adversarial uh, generation of, of environments. You start off with some training data set uh, and then you augment your data set using adversarial examples uh, chosen in a kind of specific way, uh, changing only the, the task relevant uh, features uh, of, of environments. Okay. Um, and we implemented this on on a on this kind of manipulation or grasping example uh, and compared it with uh, standard uh, baselines, uh, so things like domain randomization uh, for like sim to real uh, transfer, and we see uh, some improvements uh, in terms of the the generalization uh, performance uh, for these objects. So, so maybe I have a question. Uh, yeah, we had a, a number of different. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. Maybe a question. So, how do you define what is relevant for the task over there? Because you only take the point cloud, for example, or you compute yeah. you know, some features on it. Yeah. So, the trick here is to not hand specify what is relevant, but actually to learn what is relevant. Uh, and the way we do this is by kind of iterative training. So, we start off with some base policy. So that base policy is, is sensitive to certain things and insensitive to other things. So maybe it is sensitive to, to color, uh, but it's also sensitive to shape. Uh, and then we kind of iteratively uh, update that, that policy um, by learning like what is relevant to that policy uh, and then doing distribution robust optimization. So we end up with a new policy that's slightly less sensitive uh, to color, let's say. Uh, and so like over iterations, uh, we start to learn uh, what is relevant and, and what is uh, not relevant for the, the task. Uh, so that, that's kind of the, uh, the intuition. So not necessarily specifying by hand what's relevant, but learning uh, what, what's relevant for the, the task. But wouldn't that depend on if we can interpret the features that are being learned by the network? I mean, otherwise, how do we, for example, if I learn shape and color, then yeah. in, in the next step, how do we you know, reduce the importance of Color. Um, yeah, so what, what we do is, um, so we're learning this latent representation that where uh, basically distance in the latent space uh -huh. uh, corresponds to differences in cost. Uh, so if two points are close together in the learned re latent representation, they have a, a, a similar cost. Uh, and so if your policy is not sensitive to color, let's say, then uh, like I two see. objects with the same color are going to get mapped to uh, like a, a point that's uh, very close in the latent space. Yeah, so the additional structure that you're imposing in the sense of additional predictor that you are having that says yeah. the distance yeah. in the latent space should predict the cost and that helps you get a weighting on what feature. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Good. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, I guess, how are we doing on time, by the way? So we have, you know, maybe seven minutes after okay. noon. So you can, yeah. you know, walk in then, or if you want to start two minutes before, that's also fine. But yeah. Yeah, maybe we can we can take some questions. So I, I mentioned, I, I guess I won't say too much about uh, uh, like this fundamental limits direction. I just want to say that we've been we've been thinking about how to uh, come up with uh, fundamental limits on on uh, uh, performance or, or safety uh, when you have imperfect uh, sensing. Um, and actually, let me yeah, let me just skip to the uh, uh, just the kind of current and, and future directions we're thinking about, and then, and then I'll take some uh, questions in the remaining time. Uh, so I think one uh, important challenge is is improving the the strength of the generalization guarantees we're able to get. Um, I guess I, I personally was was pretty excited that we're able to get uh, pretty strong and meaningful guarantees. So, so success rates in the uh, the ninety uh, uh, kind of percent range. Um, but of course, in practice, we want uh, stronger guarantees if we're going to confidently uh, deploy these systems out in the real world. Partly, it's a matter of scaling, I think, so using larger uh, training data sets. Uh, partly, I think it's also uh, thinking beyond uh, kind of end-to-end -end, uh, training. Uh, so one direction I'm pretty excited about and we've been thinking about is how can we uh, combine existing formal guarantees that come from uh, like safe planning algorithms uh, that assume that your perception is correct. Uh, so maybe yeah, if, if you assume that your uh, perception system is kind of localizing uh, obstacles uh, correctly, uh, there are techniques that that uh, allow you to to plan um, like without uh, collisions. But then, how do you use some of these generalization techniques to to give you guarantees on the perception system and then combine those guarantees 
uh, with the, the safety guarantees that you get uh, from kind of more classical model-based uh, planning uh, techniques. Uh, other things we've been thinking about is how to incorporate different kinds of prior knowledge. Uh, so I mentioned a, a few uh, before. So we've been thinking about different ways to uh, take inductive biases and kind of uh, use that uh, within these uh, this uh, pack-based learning uh, pipeline to improve the, the strength of the guarantees. Uh, another important direction is, is to perform auto-distribution detection within a particular episode. Uh, so the technique I mentioned, uh, we're looking at uh, the violation of the cost across kind of multiple uh, runs, like multiple uh, episodes. Uh, and that's what, what what's uh, giving us the signal that the robot is operating on the auto distribution. Uh, in practice, you'd like to just deploy a robot in, in one specific environment. Uh, and then within that uh, run, uh, realize that the, the robot is, is operating uh, out of uh, distribution. Uh, and finally, I think good ways of, of specifying distribution shifts. So this is a uh, still an open question. So things like KL divergence are, are maybe not a good way uh, to concretely capture the set of possible distribution shifts that your robot might encounter. Uh, we've been thinking about the, the Wasserstein metric in particular that has some advantages, but I think uh, doing this in a, in a kind of a physically meaningful way uh, is an important uh, open question. So yeah, just to, to conclude, I've, I've presented uh, some of our work on, on using uh, generalization theory uh, to learn policies uh, with bounds on performance uh, on novel environments. Uh, and examples include systems with rich sensory inputs and, and neural network-based uh, policies. Uh, and I also uh, talked about how can we, we can use some of this theory to perform uh, auto-distribution detection uh, and also auto-distribution uh, generalization. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I guess, hopefully I've convinced you that some of these theoretical techniques have some uh, potential to uh, to make some, some meaningful formal guarantees on generalization and safety for our our learning enabled uh, control uh, systems. Uh, this is our, our group at Princeton. So we have uh, eight uh, PhD students currently. Uh, and Sushant Veer, who was a postdoc in the group, uh, who was involved with uh, a lot of the work that I presented, is now a, a senior research scientist at uh, NVIDIA in the uh, autonomous vehicles group. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. I'll leave you with this uh, conclusion slide uh, and take any uh, further questions you have. Thanks. Let's thank Ani for the wonderful talk. So we do have some time for questions. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> how much do, do you think the performance can be improved with just better optimization? So pushing that upper bound lower, because when yeah. you use DeepRL or SGD, you're probably not doing the best you can. Yeah, no, I think, that, I think that's a great, Question: um, Part of the a major part of the the challenge here is is good optimization. So we're optimizing that pack based uh, objective. Uh, we've explored a, a number of different uh, techniques. Um, so kind of modifying uh, standard uh, RL algorithms, things like uh, SAC, like soft data critic. Um, we've also explored like black box optimization, so derivative free optimization, like uh, evolutionary strategies, and so on. Uh, like cross entry method and, and and variants of that. Um, I, I do think that's that's still a, a challenge. Uh, if you have thoughts on maybe other techniques we should explore to to do that optimization or guide that optimization, I'd definitely be curious to hear. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> something I wanted to understand a little better is so um, you you're optimizing this pack phase objective that's regular training cost plus this regularization term. And you said that's yeah. fundamentally based on like a KL divergence. Yeah. Of, and so is your statement at the end of future work of like um, different ways to quantify distribution shift? Um, my question is that if your training cost is really good and that it's this regularization term that suddenly makes your bound like say that you might not do very well. I would yeah. want to take that and go back to my training pipeline and change something. Yeah. Yep. And I'm trying to understand like, how do I use that as a signal for what I need to do differently to get a better performance Good. guarantee? Good. Um, and yeah, it seems really cool. related to how unstructured that distribution quantification is. Is that, am I have yes. the right idea there? 
Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly right. So, uh, so in the setting that you mentioned where the, the training cost is, is low uh, and the regularization term is, is high, uh, what that means is uh, basically we don't have strong enough inductive bias. So our prior uh, distribution over the, the weights of our uh, policy um, was kind of pretty bad. Uh, and so in order to decrease the training cost, our posterior distribution had to move like pretty far away from the, the prior distribution. Uh, so I think to uh, operationalize that, uh, one thing we could do is, is um, like come up with a, a better, uh, like prior basically. Um, so it's uh, like a, a distribution that, that better captures the, the prior knowledge. Uh, there's a, a slight kind of, uh, or important like caveat here, which is uh, we're not allowed to have that kind of feedback loop of, of changing the prior on the same training data set. Um, so the pack base bound holds uh, only if the prior was chosen kind of independently of the training data set. So you choose the prior, then you observe the training data set, uh, and then you choose a, a posterior. Uh, so we're not allowed to uh, change the, the prior based on the training data set, but potentially you could collect some fresh data um, and, and then apply the, the pack base bound with, with that, and then use the original data set uh, to come up with a, a better uh, prior distribution. Okay, I think we might be out of time, but I had a quick minor follow up, but I can maybe follow up with you more later. I was thinking, so you're talking about updating the prior. I was actually yeah. thinking a lot along the lines of how should I change my training data set to improve uh, this okay. sound. Um, but if there's not time to talk about that now, I can maybe ask you uh, later on. But if you have a quick <laughs> response to that question about like, I can change my, like one knob I have is my prior, but 